I'm Mel Cooper, and today I want to talk to you about Beethoven's one and only opera, Fidelio. For me, it's one of the great iconic operas of Western culture. It's one of the best operas ever written. I absolutely adore it. It has in it as much drama as you can possibly want, despite the fact that for some people it has a reputation of being static, and it also has in it some of the greatest music, right up there with Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. It's an absolutely superb work, which meant a great deal to him, and indeed he took around ten years to get it right. Because of that, we've got a version of it called Leonore, which is very rarely done, and for which there ended up being three different attempts at overtures. So that's why you've got Leonore overtures one, two, and three. But the Fidelio overture is the final version, and the final opera, as performed in, I think it was about 1817, is simply magnificent. It's an opera that's also pivotal between the classic era and the romantic era, and it's very important to know that it's part of a series of plays and operas that were done in that era, which were called rescue operas, and which were very influenced by the fact of the French Revolution. The story is essentially a woman whose husband has been taken away by a tyrant. She doesn't know where he is. She's been looking for him for two years, three years, and finally she comes to a prison where she thinks he's being held. She disguises herself as a young man. Her name is Leonore. She calls herself Fidelio. When the curtain goes up, the prison uh, jailer's daughter is ironing or something, and she's being accosted by a young man who works in the prison who's in love with her, and with whom she's clearly had a bit of a romance beforehand, but now she has fallen in love with Fidelio. And there's all this comic stuff, so you think at first that you're maybe going to be getting a comic opera. However, what happens is, after Marcelina sings her little aria about how she's in love with Fidelio and she'd really like to marry him, her father, the jailer, comes in, and then Fidelio arrives, having done some tasks. And Fidelio, in all the best productions I've seen, is a slightly brooding, intense young man. So the romanticism comes in. And there's some wonderful music where, um, first, there's a quartet, and you get the feelings of all the different uh, players in the opera, essentially, some of the main characters. And then it goes down to a trio because of the supposed romance. And the jailer obviously wants Fidelio to marry his daughter. And the daughter is so keen, and Fidelio knows better than to blow her cover by saying anything except, yes, of course, yes, uh, of course I'm interested. And then once that's established, the jailer sings, again, a slightly comic opera about the importance of money and the, and the way in which money will influence whether or not they have a happy marriage. At that point, um, the scene changes, and the guy who runs the county, as it were, in Spain, which is where it's taking place just before the Revolutionary Era, arrives, and it turns out that he's a tyrant. He's a, he's a figure that you can equate to Stalin or Hitler, but in a small way, Mussolini maybe. And he has arrested this man who he wants to kill because the guy can blow his cover and can give him away to the king and to the good people of the country. Fidelio overhears this and overhears the plan to kill the prisoner who's being kept in the deepest dungeon in solitary confinement. And first of all, she wonders if it's her husband, but secondly, she goes into this fantastic set piece, Aria and Cabaletta, really, um, in which she is really reveals herself, reveals, reveals her emotions, and she declares that even if this guy turns out not to be her husband, she is going to make sure that he is not killed. She's going to rescue him somehow from all this tyranny and oppression. At this point, I think it's important to remind you, or tell you if you don't know the opera, that the form of the opera is not through composed. This is an early German opera. It's coming off the back of uh, Mozart's abduction from the Seraglio and his um, magic flute, and it's in the form of what's called a Zingspiel, which means that some of the story moves forward in spoken dialogue, where they want to swiftly get you to understand certain aspects of the tale, and some of it moves forward 
forward in the form of the sung arias and trios and quartets, which show you the emotions more, but also sometimes move the story forward. As, for instance, when Fidelio declares that she is going to save this man, whoever he may turn out to be. The reason I'm making this point is because I recently saw a production in which some idiot director left out the dialogue. This is like going to see West Side Story or Oklahoma and taking out the dialogue. What it means is you miss about a third of the story and you also miss a lot of the motivation because in the next sequence Fidelio discusses with the ro jailer Rocco the plight of all the prisoners and the need for them to be given a little exercise, a little sunlight. And after this discussion she persuades him and he allows the prisoners out into the yard hence leading to one of the most important musical moments in the opera, which is the chorus of the prisoners rediscovering the sun and the fresh air. But if that dialogue is missing, you don't get it that it's Fidelio who made this happen, that she is the one who has this motivation and this understanding of the plight of these people who are being kept in this horrible prison. Anyway, after this, uh, the chorus of the prisoners, um, the nasty man comes in again, Don Pizarro, and he's furious that the prisoners have been let out. And Rocco covers by saying, well, it's the king's birthday, so they had to celebrate. And also it's a way of distracting people from the murder that's about to happen. And that's the end of Act One. In Act Two, we're suddenly in the deepest dungeon, and the curtain goes up with a lovely musical passage that, that just expresses perfectly the anguish, the despair, the depth of the jail, the whole thing, the darkness, and that darkness is very important. So it's an absolutely iconic opera of Western culture, and in fact it is so iconic that it has always remained an important one in times of turbulence. For instance, at the end of World War II, many German and Austrian opera houses reopened with the performance of Fidelio because of the very obvious symbolic nature of an opera with this story, with the tyrant, with the victory of democracy, with the victory of the good guys at the end of a war in which they had had Nazism. And indeed this has continued and there's been a real fashion in the last 20 years, which I sometimes have trouble with, of, of updating the Fidelio opera visually and setting it in modern day concentration camps of various sorts. The opera has a lot of political dimensions, but in the end it works so well because it is so humane and you really do care about every one of the characters and you care about them and understand them through the music of course. So if you possibly can, see Fidelio. If you can't, buy a good DVD or get the CD.